welcome everybody to our second discussion where we will also try to give a bit of an international experience and connecting that with the Estonian particular experience on having such a, a plethora of convenience voting mechanisms, including uh, the uh, own, being the only country offering internet voting with all of its elections without any uh, restrictions. I have uh, the honor that I will have two great speakers with me on the one inside Marina Kaljorand and Jan Neute, who I will introduce in a little bit uh, in more detail. Before that, I will just want to give you this uh, uh, quick intro from my side in terms of uh, how I see what we need to protect, right? So when we talk about elections, it is important to understand that it's actually a very special social process that actually is culminating of over a year-long process in one single day. It, and that day is kind of like the celebration of democracy that allows us to actually see what are the different opinions, what are the different options that we have. And going towards this day is actually the first step that we have to secure, and that is the campaigning. And that has come under threat more than we even ever anticipated in the most recent years, not so much due to opinions that are being raised, but actually on how the voters are being channeled towards those opinions and whether we can trust them, right? And here, technology has played a crucial role with what started originally as, uh, in a positive sense, one-on-one -on -one marketing. We had early startups in the 2000s called Razorfish and other innovative companies, but that has turned today in this what we can call fake news, filter bubbles, and the problem that people that might have a certain preference for certain political uh, areas can be targeted very clearly with not correct information. And it becomes very difficult to actually provide unbiased information to them. And here we have a crucial problem with the electronic channel. But that is only one part of what we need to secure. We also need to secure all the different elements that also Lisa and, and, and uh, uh, Prof President Ilves and uh, Maritia were mentioning beforehand that we actually need to look at all steps of the electoral process and to uh, really protect that. And of course, in particular, in a pandemic that we have uh, ongoing today, we really have a choice between the good, kind of like the sanitizing of our polling stations, the bad, meaning to switch immediately over to postal voting, which might be not in a, in a sufficient way uh, build up or having the necessary trust unless you have done that for the past 30 years, like in Switzerland, or you need to rush to introduce internet voting, which in particular the Estonian experience has shown that you need several years to prepare credibly the internet voting channel. And if you look at our neighboring country, Lithuania, that tried to or had to do that because of a political war within three months, they actually failed to do so. So I would say we really have this choice between the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to short-term reactions. But if we have plenty of time, we can actually really uh, solve also this issue about identifying voters, about securing their vote in an anonymous way, and finding different ways around that that we have already discussed beforehand. What we want to discuss now in this session is really to look at global experiences on trying to understand how can we actually uh, manifest and actually get a hold of this foreign interference. And uh, I would like to start with the first intervention from Marina Kallurand, who is currently elected to the European Parliament and in the past has actually racked up a number of experiences dealing on the one hand with the cyberspace and diplomacy on the other hand. So she has been a member to the UN Secretary's General High-Level high Panel on Digital Cooperation between 2018 and 19. She has been, she is currently the Commissioner of the Global Commission of the Stability of Cyberspace, GCSC, that she has chaired between 2017 and 2019. Before that, she actually has served as the Estonian Foreign Minister and uh, has been acting on various bodies, but also served as ambassador for Estonia to the State of Israel, Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Canada, and the United States of America. I think there is hardly anyone else that can give us such a good insight on how can we secure the cyberspace in the times of elections. Then Marina, please. You have the floor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Robert, for a very kind introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here in discussion with Jan. Hi, Jan, wherever you are. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to the first panel, which put right questions into right frames. So I think for us, it's pretty good to continue where they stopped. A 
but before going to international and global affairs, I'm speaking from Brussels, yeah? We are, we are on a remote mode. I mean, the European Parliament, we are doing the voting in the European Parliament. What does it mean? It means that I receive an email, I do my ticks, I print it out, I take a photo, I send it somewhere, then I get another paper which is signed, I send it once again, and that's also called voting. Is it safe and secure? I hope so. But that's the way European Parliament is working. Uh, what is good about the present situation? I would say that the COVID crisis accelerated all digital topics so that the digital topics are high on political agenda. And I would argue that maybe they are finally reaching the, the 13th or 23rd floor of any establishment where they have finally reached the CEO level and the level of politicians. Do my colleagues in the European Parliament feel comfortable with digital topics? Not all of them. So my first, maybe my first thought before going international is to involve more politicians, members of parliaments, national parliaments, European Parliament, into discussions like this, to make them feel comfortable, to make them feel understand what we are discussing. Because I can see it even with one, one year experience in the European, European Parliament, when we start talking about digitalization, there are specific persons, the same persons, appearing in all the discussions. So we should widen it. And I would say that multi-stakeholders should not be only governments, private sector, academia, IT people, but also politicians. Now on the EU level, uh, 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 digitalization, as I said, it, it's been mentioned as a priority. And when Commission, uh, when President Leiden speaks, and she mentions Green Deal, Digital Deal, I believe that it is a priority for her. So one of the questions I have is, uh, how much resources do we have? and how able we are to cooperate among all European member states. I'll take an example of digital, European digital ID. At the moment we're working on the Digital Services Act in the Parliament. Digital services will never work in Europe without digital ID. European digital ID has been under discussion for now almost, I don't know, 10 years. The regulations directives in place have not been brought to life, are not implemented, are not applied properly, so that the Council in October this year, a month ago, once again called on the need of pan-European digital ID. Why, why, why don't we have it? Because there's no trust. It was mentioned by many previous speakers that we are lacking trust, but tr trust is something that we need very much not only for online services, but maybe even more for offline services. Today, there are only 14 EU member states who have digital IDs in place that can be connected or that can be used for cross-border uh, cross services. That's definitely not enough. Uh, another thing I, want, I would like to say on the European level is there's lots of talk about disinformation. And as one of my Jewish friends has said, this information has been around as long as we have the Bible. That was my Jewish friend, so please don't quote me. But this information has been around. I understand that we are very critical towards big platforms, but I'd also like to recognize the work that the platforms like Facebook and Twitter have done. Can you imagine that three years ago, anybody would have said that US president's tweet is false or should be, should be controlled. I, I would say it's a big thing. Even if the president is President Trump and you might hesitate about it, his tweet, but to say it publicly, please check it's this information, it's good. I see that President Dilvas is still with us. Well, he's on the board of Facebook. Uh, this information board or whatever board it's called, supervisory board, which will be looking into the incidents where uh, uh, platforms start checking or controlling what information they have uh, disabled or what information they still have on their uh, on, uh, online. So I'm really, I, I want to say that platforms have made a step. Is it enough? 
Sure, they, have, they can do much more, they can do more quickly, but we have to recognize what they have done already. And now going on the global level, uh, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, which has, which as Robert said, I really had the privilege to chair from 2017 to 2019, started its work in 2017. It was a year of the DNC hacks. It was a year when President Obama and his administration attributed DNC hacks and took some diplomatic measures, uh, contrameasures against those who were behind those attacks. So, of course, one of the topics that the, the Global Commission discussed was elections. The very first, first topic we discussed was the protection of the public core of uh, Internet. The second, protection of elections. And when we were discussing it, and please remember, we had experts from Berkeley to Beijing, from Thailand to Johannesburg. We had uh, members from Russia, we had members from China, it was really global. And we had members from Microsoft, from industry, and I'm really happy that Jan is again with us, because Jan and his colleagues made a big, uh, big impression and participated very actively uh, in the work of the Global Commission. And when we were defining the norm, or non-interference with electoral systems, we had a discussion, should we limit it to democratic elections or not? Should we tell from the very beginning, Russian and Chinese colleagues, we are not talking about your elections, we want a norm which concerns only democratic elections. In the end, we phrased it in the way that we do not make difference between democratic or non-democratic elections. So we just called state and non-state actors not to pursue, support or allow cyber operations intended to disrupt the technical infrastructure essential for elections, referenda or plebiscites. That was the norm. Why did we do the norm? There is international law out. There are other norms already out because we have to start talking more intensively to international community. I'm not naive. I understand that when we say free and open internet, we have different understanding in Thailand, in Brussels, or in Beijing or Moscow. I understand that. But we already have norms in place introduced by uh, United Nations General Assembly that were drafted by the GG group of governmental experts. We have already 13 norms. But still we thought that it's, also, it's very important for our commission to say it's not okay to interfere with elections. We were not talking about this information. We were talking only about critical infra of elections, only purely about cybersecurity. Because if we had this information and that information operations difficult to agree on global arena, if we talk about interference, non-interfering with critical infra of elections, then we thought that we might receive more global attention and more global support. And at one point, it might be accepted as, as a rule, like money laundering. For tens of years, it took place, nobody reacted. But then at some point, it was agreed among states that it's not okay to participate in money laundering. So the aim of the norm where the Global Commission proposed was the same, to make it recognized by states that it's not okay to interfere with critical infra of electoral systems. Uh, and my final point, as I said, I'm not naive about the United Nations, I'm not naive about global, uh, global uh, trends. Yes, they can do a lot with awareness raising, capacity building, confidence building, but the clear reaction can come from like-minded. It can come from Europe, it can from, come from NATO. I listened how President Ilves was critical towards NATO and the EU not doing enough in cooperation, and I agree. Cooperation can, do, can be much, much better. But let me, let's, uh, let me remind that EU is 27. When we talk about foreign policy, security policy, we were not able to introduce sanctions against Lukashenko for a month. Because these are different countries, these are different backgrounds, these are different political interests. So even a small step of cooperation in the EU should be appreciated 
And I think that a big step was taken summer this time when for the first time EU imposed sanctions against cyber attacks. More specifically, for the first time it used the cyber diplomacy toolbox, which we have had now for three years, uh, very concretely against six individuals and three entities who were responsible or involved in several cyber attacks, including uh, attack against Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, also WannaCry, NotPetya, and Operation Cloud Hopper. So we are not perfect. We are doing something on a regional level. We have to do much more. And yes, Robert, I'll stop here and look forward to Jan's remarks and our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, uh, for this great intervention. And actually, uh, that you have already built a bridge very nicely for me to introduce uh, Jan Neutze, who is the current Senior Director for Digital Diplomacy at uh, Microsoft, where, she, where he's also leading the Defending Democracy program, uh, where he works to advance policy and technical solutions to defend against election interference and disinformation. Jan joined Microsoft in 2011, and he has served in a range of policy and strate strategy leadership roles in, the Europe, in Europe and the U.S., and he's including leading Microsoft's security policy team in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, which was based in Brussels, and the work on, of Microsoft on cyber conflict as part of the company's trustworthy computing initiative in Redmond, uh, Washington. So uh, he has also served as, as a number of advisory roles on tech policy issues, such as co-chair of the Global Future Council on Cybersecurity of the World Economic Forum, and as an advisor to the partnership on countering foreign influence operations of the Carnegie Endowment, and as a board member of the Global Commission on Cyber Stability. So before joining Microsoft, uh, he came from the UN, the United Nations headquarters, where he served as, for three years in the UN Secretary General Executive Office and the Department of Political Affairs. So Jan, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you about the efforts that you and your and Microsoft are doing in the area of democracy where it normally would not be so much expected to be acting on. So maybe you can also highlight why that is the case. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. And thank you <clears throat> to the organizers for inviting me to this excellent uh, discussion and, and important and timely conference. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, share the, the panel with uh, Minister Kalyuran. Marina, it's wonderful to see you. Um, as well as President Ilves and, and all the other speakers, of course. Um, let me maybe start out by outlining uh, some of the work that Microsoft has been doing in this space, and specifically really the, the work of the Defending Democracy program, which uh, I have the uh, privilege of, of leading. We started this program uh, in early 2018, so we're uh, coming up to uh, our two and a half, almost three year mark, uh, really with um, the core belief that technology companies uh, have a responsibility to help protect our democratic processes and institutions globally from cyber-enabled threats. Uh, a large part of why we believe we have this responsibility and why we're engaging, uh, to, to address your question, Robert, why we're engaging in these uh, issues and uh, try to offer solutions stem from the fact that we want customers, voters, citizens around the world uh, to trust in technology. And technology we've seen in time and again uh, can be a double-edged sword. Technology can be exploited by, by bad actors out there, including, uh, as we uh, heard in the first panel, to undermine uh, both the, the integrity of elections, uh, potentially alter the outcome of elections, but also uh, to undermine the trust in the entire electoral process. And so what we want to do is quite the opposite, and that is to leverage both technology and policy solutions to try and strengthen the resilience of democratic processes and institutions. And as part of the work of our program, we do that uh, principally across three uh, pillars. First, we are working to protect political campaigns, but also uh, many other actors in the democratic space, such as journalists, uh, human rights defenders, and others uh, to protect them from hacking, uh, through enhancing their resilience, uh, to uh, enhance cyber threat monitoring, but also through education and training, and really giving them access to security tools that they may otherwise uh, not be able to uh, properly leverage or uh, afford, frankly, some of these 
um, are solutions that Fortune 500 companies would would use, and we try to make them available um, for either at, at, at discounted pricing or for free in many cases to those very important democratic stakeholders, because we, again, think that there is a, a key gap that needs to be addressed where these stakeholders are uh, up against oftentimes nation state uh, actors who have a vast resources and determination uh, to to uh, to undermine the ability of, of those actors to uh, participate in the democratic process. The second pillar then uh, is focused on um, election integrity, and that really is uh, about exploring solutions to safeguard the integrity of the voting process. And I'll talk a, a little bit about um, one of the things that we're uh, doing in that space, and that is um, a technology we call election guard. More on that in a moment. And then the third pillar relates to our work on disinformation defense. And that's uh, something that we are doing both uh, directly as Microsoft, where we're trying to put forward analysis, but also uh, some, some tools to help uh, voters uh, be more resilient when it comes to engaging, for example, with a very diverse and complex media ecosystem. So one core tenet of that work is focused on strengthening digital and media literacy. Um, but it's also uh, to focus computational propaganda and junk news uh, by strengthening third party efforts, uh, whether it is the work that's going on in um, academic uh, contexts. For example, Princeton University has done uh, some groundbreaking research on computational propaganda, as has the Oxford Internet Institute. And so really trying to turbocharge those, those efforts by, by supporting them uh, with our resources. So that's a very brief overview of um, the mission and the work of our program. What I might add at the outset is uh, our mission is focused to uh, defend uh, elections in democratic countries. I think President Ilves made a really important point. Uh, we are um, uh, squarely focused on working in the 75 or so democracies around the world. Uh, obviously, that is where we believe elections have a, a, a fundamental a role to play as part of democratic societies. And we have engaged to date in about, I want to say 40 or so countries. Uh, we're hoping to eventually get to all 75 democracies. And we're doing this really in a mix of um, uh, different, different programmatic ways. One of the things I might point out is we have a program that we launched called Account Guard. And what Account Guard uh, does is it provides it's a, it's a free service that provides special monitoring for political campaigns, but also many of the other groups I, I, I mentioned uh, against nation state, um, both uh, uh, probing and, and hacking, uh, which, which allows those campaigns to uh, opt into this, this program and, and roll both their organizational accounts as well as their personal email accounts, which in the context of a campaign, is very important actually, because you oftentimes are uh, dealing with a situation where a campaign springs up almost like a startup uh, and they very quickly have to scale their IT infrastructure. Oftentimes they don't necessarily have the resources to, to do that. Um, and so they rely a lot on, on, on personal um, IT infrastructure, uh, on volunteers, on family members, um, and so it, it becomes a very diverse uh, ecosystem from, a, from an IT perspective, which oftentimes is much easier to exploit by nation state actors, and then that leads to the type of hack and leak scenarios uh, that we've seen in, in, in previous years. And so what we hope to do, what we're hoping to do with Account Guard is to both provide the technology, but also the training and, and the awareness uh, that is needed to, in fact, be able to uh, set up a, a political campaign operation from a technical perspective in a way that it's most resilient and most secure. We rolled this program out in advance of the midterm elections in the U.S. in, in the summer of 2018, and we've since expanded it to over 30 uh, democracies, including um, the majority of countries in, in the European Union. The second uh, uh, highlight, I think, of, of um, something that we've been working on uh, that I think is, is interesting and relevant in particular, um, not just to the U.S., but also potentially to a number of, of European countries, um, is in the election integrity um, uh, bucket. And I, and I mentioned it uh, earlier, and that is our what we call our um, election guard service. Election guard uh, is um, something that um, goes back uh, to... 
research done in um, Microsoft Research for the last 30 years, actually, by somebody named uh, Josh Benelow, who has been researching election security and wrote his doctoral dissertation, actually, in the, in the 1980s about uh, end-to-end verifiable elections, uh, something that I think many in, folks in Estonia uh, might, might know something about. Um, and uh, what, what we uh, have, have come across and what we find is that uh, the technical implementation of truly end-to-end verifiable elections had been uh, researched and had been written about, but had never truly been, been implemented. And so what we went ahead and did is working with a number of partners to develop some open source uh, technology that's freely available uh, on, on GitHub, um, which provides uh, for this uh, end-to-end verifiable elections, meaning it allows for, you can think about it as a comprehensive public audit of the entire election tally uh, when and if election guard is integrated into an existing uh, voting uh, system. Uh, what, what that allows is, is that um, each voter can essentially uh, uh, verify that their vote was counted as cast. The way that happens is that election guard um, it uses uh, what's called homomorphic encryption, a form of encryption that allows the tallying, meaning uh, the, the addition of votes when they are individually encrypted, so nobody can see who a voter voted for to preserve privacy. Uh, and um, it provides the voter a tracking code on a piece of paper that they get to take home after they voted. And on that tracking code or with that tracking code, they can go to a public website to see um, some metadata about their vote, including where they voted and when they voted. Um, And it ensures uh, that way that you have this public record um, about their vote being included in the final tally without it having been modified in any way. Um, So again, this is a a system that um, the the concept of end-to-end verifiability has been around for a very long time. Um, It's the first time we believe it's been uh, actually implemented and we've since run a, uh, a successful uh, pilot election uh, very deliberately in a very small setting uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a small jurisdiction in Wisconsin in the United States earlier this year where we had 400, election, uh, 400 votes being cast and tallied. Uh, and the way the system worked in that instance is that we used election guard as the backup mechanism to provide the auditing um, but the um, uh, the election also included a paper record, which we think is a is a best practice. And so, having both a paper record and end to end verifiable technology, we believe is a best practice that can fundamentally strengthen the trustworthiness and the outcome, and, and strengthen a voter's confidence that their vote uh, has been has been counted as cast. There's a couple of examples of what we've been. Working on, I'll, I'll, I'll close just by um, talking very briefly about what Marina uh, covered, and that is there is both the technology uh, aspect, but there very much also is an important policy and, and geostrategic conversation to be had about uh, electoral interference. Uh, and one of the things that for a long time uh, our, our team at Microsoft has been focused on is to help strengthen uh, the global understanding of what type of norms and what type of rules of the road apply in this space. Marina mentioned uh, the important, uh, really groundbreaking work of the Global Commission on Cyber Stability in that regard. I would add uh, a couple more examples to that. Uh, The norm that the commission proposed was ultimately included in what is called the Paris Call uh, for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, which um, was uh, adopted uh, and has been endorsed by over 75 governments and over 1,000 uh, organizations really from around the world, very much a multi-stakeholder uh, effort. Um, it's also um, since been um, reiterated and strengthened uh, by um, a, a, a somewhat newer effort called um, the Oxford Process run by Oxford University, where they've brought together international lawyers from around the world uh, to uh, examine how international law applies to cyberspace. Uh, and, and they recently published a statement uh, on uh, the duty of states to not um, only not interfere in electoral processes, but also to help defend against such, uh, the duty to help defend against such interference. And I encourage the viewers to, to take a look at both the Paris call and the, and the Oxford process statement. 
uh, which I think are important reference points to try and move the global conversation forward about what um, what is uh, what, what are the expectations and what is appropriate behavior um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, defending against uh, electoral interference. So. Um, maybe some food for thought there. I'll, I'll stop and, and look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for your intervention. I think you uh, nicely highlighted how Microsoft uh, actually has the expertise with uh, your dear colleague, Josh Benalo, who is also a dear uh, friend and, and colleague of Lisa and mine. Uh, we've worked around the Evo ID conference in the past. And so really this concept of end-to-end -end verifiability is really an important one that has been picked up in different ways in different countries and different elections, including uh, the Estonian one. But I would like to go back to, to the point that you also highlighted at the end and also that Marina was show, uh, telling us a bit more about before, about this need for a global norm or a, a possibility to go into uh, uh, having kind of like something which we could say maybe an extension of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which in the end is still uh, to date the legal text that allows us to understand what do we mean by electoral standards, yeah? Uh, and so do we need to expand it or at which point will we actually get to an international law document of this of a similar value as the ICCPR? Or is that, as some colleagues say, actually something that we, which we should never achieve because we just need to interpret the existing instruments that we have, like with tools that you have before with the cyber diplomacy toolbox or with discussions around the Paris call or the Oxford process. And so is that actually a wishful thing? Maybe Marina and then Jan. Uh, yes, thank you, Robert. Uh, well, my, my brief answer is ICCPR applies to both online and offline world. Yes, the point is there that uh, international law was written mainly before internet was invented, that's true. But, uh, but again, the firm understanding, I would say, of majority of democratic community at least, is to look into existing international law, what we have today. Look into that and look at the ways of interpreting and applying it. I do not exclude that at some point we might need either new provisions or new pieces of international law do not exclude. But today is far too early to say, I would argue. Because how does the, how does the state practice evolve? It evolves through application of international law by nation states. We do not have many examples today. Just a couple of states have issued the opinions of their legal, uh, legal, legal advisors or the State Department or government. Uh, there, there haven't been serious discussions in the Security Council. Yes, there was one started by Estonia as a non-permanent member, but it was, it was like repeating our positions that we know for years already. So I would argue we have not had, have had different discussions. And my feeling is that in some cases, let's say even big states or big players do not want the very clear picture, what is allowed and what is not. On the other hand, I, th I also sometimes have the feeling that those who do not want to apply international law to cyber are interested in having gray zones. And gray zones are the worst that can happen to any ecosystem. That's the reason why it was able to do... Uh, to, to, to uh, do cyber attacks in Ukraine, just by Russia paying on the on the on the limits what is allowed, what's not, when the reaction from international community will follow, what will be that reaction. So that's why yes, we need clear picture, clear understanding what is allowed, what is not. We have to start with existing international law. We need. Uh, legal advisors of uh, ministries, departments to look into applicability of international law. And as I said, do not exclude that at some point we might consider new pieces of international law. As long as we don't have them, we need also political norms. Well, I'm a lawyer by education. I, understand, I very well understand the difference between international law and political norms. Political norms that are not legally binding, but they are political statements. 
that we adhere to those principles, we value those principles, we are going to live according to those principles. And that's why the norms that have been proposed so, so far by all the bodies we have mentioned already, I, I, but I will emphasize the GGE, because those norms have been adopted by the UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, which means that all the members of the United Nations should have them as their example of behavior, of responsible state behavior. So we have to have the norms, and through norms we might uh, we might evolve, we might, we might come to new pieces of uh, international law. And uh, uh, what what, uh, uh, what I forgot to say earlier, but what I also like to underline is that international community is changing. This year we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And never before has there been a declaration on cooperation and security of cyberspace. In this declaration, there was not to the big part, but it was mentioned. And it is a big thing that in the United Nations globally, we are thinking about stability and, and uh, safety of cyberspace. Again, I repeat now the third time, I'm not naive. And I understand that globally we can do only some limited things, but we have to continue the global dialogue and we have to go forward with application of international law, with interpretation of international law, mainly with a group of like-minded. And we should not keep it a close group. It should be open to everybody who uh, shares the same values and principles as the like-minded democratic, democratic countries do. Okay, thank you, Marina, for, for these elaborations. Jan, uh, do you share Marina's views? I do, I do actually, um, and I think Marina really summarized it very well. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, we, we're currently still living in a situation where there, there is growing understanding um, of how international law applies, but there are still some, some differences clearly in the international community about where exactly those boundaries lie. And so in the absence of a more comprehensive um, and really ultimately global understanding, uh, developing norms and focusing on their implementation and application uh, is incredibly important. And so uh, there are different different legs to, to the stool, if you will, um, that, that all need to be advanced simultaneously. I'll, I'll come back again to um, why I think the, the work, um, in particular, the recent work um, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the group at Oxford is, is so important because the whole mandate and mission there has been, um, as, as, as I understand it, uh, to look at international law as it is today, um, and from there, from from that, derive uh, principles about how it should be applied. And when you look at the statement um, that they put out a few weeks ago um, on international law protections against foreign electoral interference uh, through cyber means, it really does articulate um, a, a very a very um, substantive understanding of, of of what international law provides today. Could there be an evolution over time where uh, this understanding uh, is then translated into, um, for example, a dedicated uh, legal instrument. Absolutely, we've seen that in other in other parts uh, and, and, and other substantive areas. Uh, when we think about, for example, terrorism um, or or other um, many other aspects um, of of security uh, uh, policy. But Marina is right. I think we need to put in place the building blocks to over time get to that global understanding. Um, and then, and then, hopefully, come to a place where we um, have have this global um, consensus and 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 ultimately greater stability. Uh, because one thing is clear: the the current situation is um, f fairly far from stable. <laughs> we, we we have many many actors in this space who have discovered that uh, using cyber means is a very cost effective, low barrier of entry way to meddle in the affairs of another state. And, and democracies clearly are um, at an outside size risk here, again, as President Ilves outlined earlier, um, since um, they are the ones who are uh, organizing uh, open, free and fair elections and having these processes targeted, be it through cyber means or through disinformation or um, what most of us, I think, are worried about, or many of us are worried about a combination of both. Um, it continues to be a huge challenge. It will continue to be a challenge, even if we didn't see, um, if, if we didn't see significant uh, interference. And this is 
something we can confirm from our end. We did not see significant foreign um, interference um, in the U.S. elections on November 3rd. And we are convinced that this is an issue that will continue to be uh, a challenge and that we all need to guard against uh, going going forward. I will- I would like to come back to the U.S. Uh, directly because back in, in 2016 and uh, with the U.S. presidential election, that that interference has actually been clearly attributed to the Russian Federation. And likewise, also around the uh, cyber attacks, which actually started the debate around cybersecurity uh, with the Estonian uh, basic denial of service attack uh, on Estonian infrastructure. So. Why is attribution so important in, in, in cyber attacks and uh, including with those international norms? Um, and why is it so difficult to act upon it, right? So, I mean, and that links then to our discussion from before on getting that global norm. Whoever would like to answer first. As that was a question actually for the audience. And uh, uh, so I forgot to mention that if you want to have additional questions, then please put them into the Q&A tool. Okay, I'll start. I'll start. Uh, uh, but b- before going to the question, I, I just wanted to say that what Jan said is very right. We have the Oxford process, we have the Tiling Manual, we have academia looking into applicability of international law. That part is it, being done and, and I think it's done well. But I still would like to emphasize what's missing is the government's part because only states and governments can apply international law, which means that academia can do many things, but if it's not applied, and if not governments have decided what, how do they interpret what academia is proposing, it won't change anything. So it's still we need very strong commitment on application and implementation by governments, and we need state practice to see how it works in practice. On attribution, I'm a very strong believer in attribution because attribution is a very clear signal. What is allowed, what is not, who are the bad guys, what should we do with them, to put it very simply. And attribution is always difficult. It's not like the Agatha Christie where you have the gun and you have the body. In cyber, it's, it's, very, it's maybe, maybe comparable to the Skripal case where there are many hypothetical, you have to convince your partners, that you have enough information. You have to be very clear with how much of information you disclose because you can't disclose all the way of attribution, not jeopardizing yourself. So it's complicated, I get it. But it's still doable. It's doable on technical level, on legal level, and on political level. All those levels have to be included. Maybe the most difficult one I'm not an IT geek, but I think that the political level is maybe even more difficult because we have the technical level attributions and lawyers can say that, yes, it's, it's, it's against international law, but then comes the political level. Once you attribute, you have to understand that there will be measures against you. It's like diplomacy. Once you expel diplomats, your diplomats will be expelled. It's, cool. it's, it's, it's happening in the real world, so attribution always has some negative results for those who are brave enough to attribute. And maybe that's why I very much appreciate what EU has done so far with the collective attribution. 27 countries, even if the wording is uh, not very strong one, and even if the wording could have been much better, it's still, it's a big thing. 27 states said that these persons, these entities are behind those attacks and we take measures. We introduce sanctions against them. So with the attribution, with countermeasures, we clarify the picture and we make the rules more understandable to everybody. Don't mess with us or these things will happen to you. I might add to that, um, uh, Marina, by I think underlining what, what, what I, um, I think is, 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 is important and that is attribution in and of itself is not the goal. The goal is accountability, right? And attribution is one way to get to greater accountability in cyberspace, uh, which is, uh, is something that I think all of us who've been working in this space uh, are, are really um, hoping to, to, to help progress. Uh, and uh, attribution is one, is one key piece of this. And I would just uh, confirm what Marina said. There have been significant 
uh, amounts of progress made when it comes to the ability to attribute cyber attacks to nation state actors. At Microsoft, we have a dedicated team that does this uh, day in and day out. They're called the Microsoft uh, Threat Intelligence Center. Um, or, or MISTIC uh, by their abbreviation, they are at this point tracking over 50 uh, nation state actors around the clock, 365 days out of the year, um, the building threat profiles and, and, and really tracking, tracking their uh, different um, uh, operations in countries around the world, impacting our customers and then in cooperation with many others in industry and in government, um, uh, also uh, beyond just our customer base. And so it is a concerning trend, um, but we are able to, um, in many cases, attribute with high confidence uh, certain certain targeting and certain to remain vigilant. We, attribution is a key tool, but ultimately we need to get to this much broader set of accountability, and that includes what Marina mentioned. That's countermeasures, it can be sanctions and other things, and the EU certainly has been a leader um, on, um, on, on these aspects through the toolbox and other, and other uh, policy measures. Great. I would like to come to the last topic and combine basically the, those two interventions that we have in our Q&A and with your final words. I mean, as you both are kind of external to the Estonian electoral process, I would like to just give you these two questions. So which other countries have approached the Estonian government about its iVoting platform? How are we still the only country in the EU that allows online voting, even though the European Commission, and I'm not sure that it actually is the European Commission that has accepted it, is clearly fine with Estonia using it for EP elections. Uh, and then the second question, is there any future for internet voting globally due to ICT, further development and COVID uh, situation? So, I mean, and Marina, you, you highlighted before how the European Parliament is voting. Wouldn't that be time that they use a more secure version? And just... Very brief, as we only have very limited time before I give back to Merge. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll go first again very briefly. Uh, are other countries interested in Estonia's experience? I remember that before the parliamentary elections and European Parliament elections in 2019, we had about 100 delegations visiting E-Estonia iVoting Center, which means that there is huge interest. Uh, when countries are ready to do that, you need three components. First of all, you need laws and regulations in place. It means digital ID. You need services that are safe and secure. And most important, you need political will. As long as you don't have these three components, you will not be able to do that. Does the European Parliament recognize it as a safe and secure? They have to, because elections so far are in the hands of nation states. There have been, and uh, there have, there are, the, the analysis have, under, have taken place Nobody, nobody has proved that Estonian online voting is less secure than offline voting is taking place in other countries. And of course, there are risks, they have to be mitigated. And my final word on the European Parliament, I'm not saying that it's not secure what we're doing. It's just very bureaucratic, it's just very difficult, it takes lots of time, it's not efficient. But yes, I'm not putting the, into the question security of the European Parliament voting at the moment. Thank you. Um, thanks for those questions, Robert, and, and to the audience. Um, I, I think they're incredibly important questions. Um, and I also want to say I, I don't think we necessarily have all the answers yet, certainly when it comes to the question of what does the future of Internet voting look like. What I can uh, say is that um, at the end of the day, uh, just like paper um, is not a goal, paper is a medium, um, Internet voting may not be a goal, it, it may just be a, a medium. And so the question is, how can we organize uh, voting in the most safe and secure process? Um, given everything we've seen um, uh, with um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the fact that we've seen um, uh, digitization, uh, so sort of five years worth of digitization happening in, in, in more or less five months, um, I, I would strongly suspect that we may see an impact also on um, how elections are being conducted. Um, in, in terms of the use of digital technology. Um, and, and that may uh, lead to a broader application of uh, internet-based voting. What I want to say, though, is, and I want to be really clear, um, we have been very cautious from a Microsoft perspective about how to approach this issue. We think it merits further study. Um, and 
certainly would believe that um, if internet voting is, 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 is developed and deployed more broadly, it needs proper guardrails. Um, you know, Estonia has um, a lot of experience and expertise on this issue, which I think is extremely relevant for other democracies around the world. So I'm not surprised by the level of interest that Marina just described. Um, I've, I've had a chance to visit um, uh, uh, so some of the Estonian uh, uh, institutions working on this. And I remember seeing a, a large map um, uh, indicating where all these visitors were coming from. And it really highlights, I think, how this interest is, 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 is global. Um, and so you have a lot to, to share with, with others based on, on your experience. Um, and so I think we, we need to take the best of what Estonia has developed and maybe think about what other guardrails exist, um, uh, whether it is end-to-end -end verifiable technology um, or, or, or other technologies. Um, uh, but but I, I, would just, I would just suggest that um, when we look at all the other aspects of how technology is being deployed and, and how that deployment is accelerated in the context of this pandemic, I'm sure we can make some progress uh, and, and, and there will be demand uh, for exploring what more can be done in this space. And we're certainly open to having that conversation, but we also yeah. want to be really measured and, and, and cautious when we do. Thank you, Jan and, and Marina, for those great interventions. I think it has clearly shown us that on the one side, we need to have those global norms to help us uh, actually govern this election interference more uh, effectively. Right. And on the other hand, we also need to get a better understanding of the technology and how to uh, actually uh, make everyone believe that it's working properly, because that is also an important element of this. And the other hand, if we don't get a good understanding of how to do also things like elections during a pandemic where we all work from home, we might all get caught off guarded and have to live with an insecure solution. Uh, or not as secure as it could be if we do our homework. With that, I would like to hand over to Merge uh, for the further proceedings of this conference. Thank you again, Marina and Jan. Uh, it was a great discussion with you.